the the virus and the fact that we're being isolated is planet Earth sending us to our room. And in our room, we're being told by the authorities, stay inside or go inside and stay inside. Well, to me, that's a very metaphysical command. That means go inside you. So I've been taking the stance that this is a good thing. And while we're inside, it's our time to reflect, to meditate, to contemplate, to create. This is our time to reset ourselves. This is our time to find out what do we really want and what do we want to contribute to the world. This is also the most fantastic time for people to learn anything that they want or to open any business they want online. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography, but business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, I'm very excited today. I got Dr. Joe Vitale on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Dr. Joe Vitale, he's an author of, I don't know, 80 plus books, probably even more than that, a speaker, consultant, coach, musician, magician, and was in the movie The Secret. Kind of went from homeless to making millions and is one of those self-help authorities who knows how to clear blocks out of people when, they, when they, they're stuck. Um, I don't know. Is that, is that a decent uh, intro for, I mean, or, or, or did I miss anything there? <laughs> anything you want to say will pass as an intro. As long as you had my name in there, we're fine. And well, you did. I, I love it. I love it. So Dr. Joe Vitale and I, we... We met because of a mutual friend, uh, Daniel Barrett, and uh, you're getting, you know, you you were doing some music, and I I, I kind of roped in uh, to do some vid- a video for you. It's got over a million views on YouTube. Um, well, let's just go ahead and start there. It's it's not usually where we start in the uh, podcast story, but I love, you know, like how did you become a musician? Right? It's not like because I know you started when you were not. 12 years old, right? So <laughs> let's start there just because that's fun for me. I, I kind of want to know, like, how did you say, okay, I'm going to be a musician now, right? Well, it's a great question and an interesting one. When I turned 60, which was seven years ago, I looked around and said, what else? I had already gone from homeless to writing 80 some books, as you pointed out, traveling around the world as a speaker, appearing in movies like you pointed out, The Secret, but there's been 15, 16 other movies, creating more digital product than I've ever could imagine anybody could create, and just having a a great run at success. And then I looked around at 60 and said, what haven't I done? What have I wanted to do? What's on my bucket list? And music was on my bucket list. I had a couple guitars, I knew three chords, And I secretly wanted to be a musician, but I wanted to be a musician who actually learned how to sing, how to write music, how to record songs, put together a band and actually go in the studio and make an album. And I used all of the self-help techniques I had learned over the decades and applied it to music. And son of a gun, not only did I record the first album seven years ago, but I've recorded 15 albums since. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's amazing. Not only did you record an album, but you had an all-star cast, right? Yeah. Like a- another Joe Vitale, yeah. the other Joe Vitale as the drummer who's, um, forgive me if this is wrong, but used to be the drummer of the Eagles. That's right. And has right. played with some amazing musicians. Um, Glenn uh, Fukugama, I, I butchered the last name, but you know, Dixie Chicks bass, right. bass guitar player. And um, so how does... Somebody who is, you know, not a professional, well, like not a musician by trade, main trade, get those people to be on your album. How do, how do they get excited to come play with you? You know, it's, it's fascinating. And there's self-help lessons all through this conversation. For one thing, you know, I said when I was 60, I looked around and said, what else 
do I want to do? And I stated a goal. I stated an intention, which is, I think, where it all starts. I just said, I want to do this. I don't know how, but I want to do it. And then the idea of getting a band together, well, I had nowhere, no idea where to start. But I also know I'm in Austin, Texas. There's musicians in every freaking house. All I have to do is <laughs> knock on a door and say, hey, man, you play the guitar? <laughs> yeah. You got somebody in there that plays the drums? Yeah. So I didn't. I wasn't worried about it at all. But when Daniel Baird and I got together, we would we do what we call popcorning. We would just start talking and we'd start dreaming big. Like, wouldn't it be cool if I was in Rolling Stone magazine? You know, first time musician, first album, and everything. But Rolling Stone, because I want to think big. And then I was thinking about drummers. And Daniel had lined up a drummer who, at the last minute, canceled. He got a better offer, got sick, or who knows what. And he said, well, we need to get another drummer. I'm not worried. And I said, well, I've been hearing about this other Joe Vitale since the 1970s. He's from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. He went to Kent State University. I went to Kent State University. We're about the same age, but we've never met each other. There have been people who contacted him thinking they were contacting me. There were people who contacted me thinking they were contacting him. So we've cross-pollinated. We've, we've touched each other, but never met, never corresponded. And I said, Daniel, I have no idea if it's possible, but I'd like to ask the other Joe Vitale. And I found an email for him on his website. I wrote a note to him. I was very respectful and said, look, I'm a first time musician. I'm doing my very first album. I don't want you to be insulted. I have no idea what you charge. I don't know what your life is like. I don't know anything. And I said, but uh, I'm going to record this album in a couple months in this studio in Austin. And would you be available? Would you be interested? And what would you charge? He wrote back in a couple days and he said he had been hearing about me. People would write to him asking for life advice, and he thought that was pretty funny. And he would write them back and say, I can tell you what kind of drum to get, but not decisions about your life. And he wrote back and he says, I'm only available for two days for the entire year. And he says, but they're the two days you want me in Austin. And I said, you're That's amazing. And he amazing. came down and Darren, it was love at first sight. We've been best friends ever since. Not only is he a drummer, he is a singer, he is a songwriter, he um, plays the flute, he's an engineer wizard, he has been behind 200 gold and platinum records, including for Joe Walsh, who's his best friend, and the Eagles, and every rock and roll legend since the, the, the mid-1970s. And I, I told him, I said, I am never recording an album without you, ever, in my life. And my six singer-songwriter albums, I have 15, 16 albums, but six singer-songwriter albums, he's on every one of them. To answer your question, I asked him. I yeah, sent an email and asked. The power of it, just asking, just putting That's it out it. there. And, and I think we're going to get really into that, but I want to get to some spots that I don't know as much, right? So how, how did you get started, right? Obviously, the story of being homeless and having some rough patches. And, you know, maybe just walk this, let's go back in time, right? Like, you know, and I think a lot of people are probably not going some, through some fantastic stages in their life right now, some rough patches too. So maybe just like, give us, uh, I think what I would like to know with it, and you can take it wherever you like, is like, how does someone go from kind of this not very good place to where you are now? And I, I, and I know that's a long journey, but like, where's the first step, right? <laughs> Well, it's a great question, and of course, I get it a lot because people want to know how did you go from homeless to best-selling author or international this or that. And there's no easy answer. Everybody's looking for the bullet. They're all looking for what's the one thing, what's the one book, what's the one seminar, what was the one insight, what was the one thought. You know, they want the one thing. And I did finally come up with the one thing. And I said, yep, there's one thing I did that got me out of homelessness and elevated me to the road to success. And that one thing was everything. I did everything. I read all the books. I listened to all the cassettes back then. When there were free seminars, I went to the free seminars. I applied everything that I was learning about. I was doing my best, throwing spaghetti on the wall, mud at the roof, whatever you want to call it, trying to find what would work. And 
the phrase overnight success is thrown around a lot. And what I have seen is that there are lots of overnight successes. And if you define overnight is about 30 years, yeah, you can be an overnight success too. <laughs> I think I read recently that uh, overnight successes on average took 13 years. And so for me, I had to do a lot of inner work. I knew I wanted to be an author when I was a kid. I wanted to write. I thought it would be fiction. I thought it would be comedy. I thought it would be plays. And I did do some of that. But I wanted to be a writer. And in order to be a writer, I went through a very long, dark night of the soul that was excruciating. And it included homelessness. It included poverty for 10 years when I was in Houston and deep, dark struggle. And through it all, I was trying to be a writer. I didn't have addictions. I wasn't wasting money on drugs or alcohol. I mean, I'm focused. I, I want this, but I'm not getting it. And one of the big insights for me, and when I tell these stories, I'm always aware that I'm trying to give an insight to the people that are listening or watching. The big insight for me was we are belief-driven people. Our reality is created from our subconscious beliefs. And while everybody will argue with that and everybody will get in a fist fight over that, and myself included, if somebody had gone back in time and found me on the streets of Dallas and said, hey, just change your beliefs, buddy, and you can, and you can be fine. It was like, you're getting decked. You're getting knocked on your ass because I didn't want to hear that. But the truth was I was creating that on an unconscious level. And like being, the starving artists, like you wanted to be, you thought that you had to go through a struggle to be exactly a, 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 a amazing artist. I think I work with a lot of musicians, right? Yes. And not as much as I used to, but I see that all the time. Yep. Like they, a lot of times they, the, they assume the struggle will come out of this, they'll be creative out of the struggle. But then when you're struggling, you have to deal with those issues of the of trying to make rent and a lot of things right. that take away your time, right? Right. But anyway, I'll, 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 starvation. Right. I'll let you continue. Well, no, it's a great insight because I discovered the same thing. The more I got into music six, seven years ago, the more I found artists who were starving. I know on one of my albums, uh, I now play the saxophone, but I didn't back then. And I wanted a saxophone player, a baritone saxophone player. And I brought him into the studio. Daniel and I found him. We brought him in. We kept him for a couple hours. I don't remember what it was. We worked on him. He had to do the, the song several times. When I asked what he wanted, he said 50 bucks. And to me, it's like, how, how are you making a living on 50 bucks? Your baritone saxophone is a collectible item that costs $15,000. You had to drive over here. You're going to have to feed yourself. And I don't know if you had any more gigs that day or not. I gave him about four times that amount of money just because I thought, you know, you got to get used to prosperity, buddy. <laughs> so let's, let's start stretching you right now. But I found the same thing. I was falling into that trap when I was a struggling writer. And I realized that I modeled my life after authors I admired who had been alcoholic, melancholy, suicidal. In fact, Jack London, the Call of the Wild Jack London, Martin Eden Jack London, the Sea Wolf Jack London, deeply influenced me. And a part of me thought my life has to be as dramatic, adventurous, as tragic as his. He was dead by the time he was 40 as a suicide. So when I started to look at my beliefs and thought, wait a minute, I can model Jack London's writing style, but let me find a different writer to model their lifestyle. And I started to move in a better direction. And I think this is true for all of us. If we're stuck in some place, most often it's because of beliefs about what we think is possible, whether it's about ourselves or about what we think is going on in the environment. But our beliefs are going to create a reality that is going to get us excited or get us depressed. And I fought with that for a very long time, partly because we didn't have the internet. We didn't have wonderful people doing things like this. It was pretty much a one-man show. It was me against the universe, and it very much felt like that. So there and was a lot about of soul-searching. And so the and our beliefs, I think we're going to keep, it's going to be a constant theme here. And I think we're going to go really deep into that. But what about the fear of being a writer? Um, and you don't have to take it back to that time period. You could also take it to today, however you want to take it. But I think a lot of people that I work with and have 
helped really struggle with like that first step. They really worried about, you know, not being good enough or, you know, there's just a lot of fears. They, they end up, I think, talking themselves out of it in some way, shape or form it, because we, you, you can make a narrative of whatever you want. So overcoming fear, um, you want to do something, but you're afraid to do it. Like what, what advice would you have there? Well, I would have a lot because I've been a very f- afraid man throughout my life. And in fact, I think the last time I saw you was at the Townsend in downtown Austin. And that yeah. was my singing songwriting debut with my band of legends. So I was performing live on stage for the first time in my life. And it was terrifying. It was freaking terrifying. With, with an all-star cast with behind a, well, you. That's which what made it I think that'd be terrifying. worse. I think that'd be worse than the people in this in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and it was because my own band shamed me into doing it. They said, we've recorded six albums together. We need to perform live. And I kept pushing it aside going, I, how can I perform with these guys? The other Joe Vitale is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Glenn Fukunaga, as you pointed out, plays with the Dixie Chicks and Daniel Barris with Porter Davis. All of these guys live on stage. I've been on stage a lot as a speaker but being on stage as a singer is a completely different experience. And so how did I overcome fear for that? Because of the truth of the matter is you saw me that night and you may not have sensed that there was any nervousness in me, but there had been terror for two months, two months beforehand. And I was doing everything that I knew to, to do from self-help, exploring my beliefs, rehearsing it mentally, doing the practice with and without the band, memorizing my songs, doing everything I could to, to make it as great as I could be. And one of the classes I took was with Usher. And I confess, I didn't know who Usher was when I took this master class. All I knew was it was a class on performing music. And it was taught by some guy named Usher. <laughs> And now laugh because I'm like, oh my God, what a legend to to sit at the feet of. And I'll never forget, this is this is such a thing to remember for all of us and help me. He said, You're gonna go ahead and you're gonna practice, you're gonna rehearse, you're gonna be polished, you're gonna be as perfect as you can be. And he says, But at the night of your performance, something will go wrong. And he talked about times where he opened up a show and he's got two hours of music and dancing and everything. And he broke two ribs on the opening number and the show must go on. And he said, something will go wrong. And as long as you know, something will go wrong. When it happens, it won't derail you in the pa- in the back of your mind. You'll think, oh, yeah, I knew something would happen. Well, that was it. And because you kind of expected it, you can roll with it. And that was one of the things that took away fear for me. The other thing that I looked at is, okay, I'm going to perform for the first time ever with these guys. It's in a small venue, but it's also being videotaped by you, you know, and you're photographing everything. So the the moment is being frozen in time here. And I thought, what if I totally just bomb? What if my voice gives out, my memory gives out? What if I'm off key and my guitar breaks? I mean, what if I faint on stage? And all of these were real possibilities in my head. I'm not just fabricating this. This is the stuff that was making me terrified. What if all that happens? Can I still go on with my life? Can I still love myself, appreciate myself, and go on and do something else? Yeah. Knowing I could survive it made it a breeze. You know, it took away that fear. It took away the terror. I find that with most people, yeah, they all have dreams. They all want to be a musician. They all want to be an author. They all want to start a business of some sort. But what they do is they talk themselves out of it. And they'll say, not me, not now. Don't have the experience. Don't have the education. Don't have the money. Don't have this. Way too much. Way too little. But you can go on forever with excuses. You really got to face the reality that this is what I really want to do. And if I don't do well at it, I will learn something as a result. And my life will go on. I think, I think there's so many uh, nuggets in there. Um one thing I do want to talk about is, so you had this master class, and you know, master classes are massive now; they're all over the place. Right. But to me, it's just another form of mentorship. Um, and again, you can take a lot of these questions the way you want, but like, 
is has there been besides so Asher, that's a great example of of a masterclass working or a mentorship. Has there been any other mentors in your life or books or anything that has really just kind of propelled you forward? What a juicy question. And it's a juicy question because I'm a book addict. Obviously. Books, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's a small sampling of what's I, available. I, I've, I've, been, I've been in your library before and there was there was books on top of books and there was desks that were books. <laughs> yes, that, that's right. Desks that were books and walls that are books. I have always been mentored by authors, many of which are long gone, but they put their wisdom in books. I have also, every time I wanted to do something, went to books first. I have always found that the wisdom of the universe has already been written down. It's in a book or a series of books, and they're all in the public library, which is where I lived during the homeless time. I mean, literally. And they're available on Amazon and all the other places that are fun to go get the books today. So I've been mentored by the greatest minds of all time. During the time that I was learning writing and copywriting and uh, marketing and everything some 40 some years ago, the greats, John Caples, Bruce Barton, P.T. Barnum, all of these guys wrote books. And in a way, I was mentored by them because of it. And so that's the first level of an answer is that I always turn to books. Uh, I'm going through quite a bit of a dark night now, and maybe we can talk about it at some point. And I've turned to stoicism to help get me through. And I've been fascinated by Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus. Mm -hmm. And these guys wrote thousands of years ago. And yet what they wrote thousands of years ago is mentoring me right now. Completely. And do you think because of that uh, growing up around books, well, maybe not growing up around books, but being around books and being inspired of them, is that one of the reasons why you wanted to become an author and have done it so often? That's a great question. You know, I I do remember reflecting on what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so I don't know if I was 13 or 14 or 15 years old, but I played with possibilities. I was interested in boxing at the time. And I thought at one point I'd be the world heavyweight boxing champion. And I was into it. You would not believe how obsessed I was. Uh, I have since met everybody from Mike Tyson to George Foreman to Floyd Patterson to Muhammad Ali. I would have been destroyed in the first five seconds of any of those fights. (laughs) But as a kid, you know, and and you're imagining, I was going to be a boxer at one point. I was going to be a magician. You said that in the introduction. I still love magic. I'm still a lifetime member of the Society of American Magicians, and Houdini influenced me. And thank God I didn't become a magician because all the ones I've ever met are starving. You know, they can entertain you at dinner, but you better buy their dinner because they don't have any money. (laughs) I thought about being uh, an attorney, which right now I'm involved with attorneys, so I'm glad that I didn't become an attorney. That would have been a dark life, a dark career for me anyway, not for somebody else. Um, I I wanted to be um, a baseball player. I wanted to be Babe Ruth. I thought, well, I was overweight as a kid. Babe Ruth was overweight. If he can do it, I can do it. You know, I don't even have to get in shape. All I have to do is hit the ball (laughs) and hit it out of the fence. But then I looked at the common denominator and books. I was reading about Houdini. I was reading about Babe Ruth. I was reading about heavyweight boxing champions. I was reading about Clarence Darrow and the other attorneys. And I thought, books. I love books. And so I kind of backed into the corner and said, you know, I could even write novels and be any of those characters. I can role play those different things that I would like to be as as a life career. So early on, I decided that I wanted to be an author. And yeah, largely because of the books that were already around me and already influencing me. How did you write your first book? Fascinating. Um, My first book was in 1984. I was trying to, like so many people, trying to find my way, trying to make a living from my passion. My passion was writing. And I created a correspondence course And it was called Zen and the Art of Writing. And I think it had five lessons to it. And again, this is before the internet. I took a classified ad out in Writer's Digest magazine saying I had this course, blah, 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 send a self-addressed stamped envelope. And I think taking the ad out probably broke me and it probably was 50 or 60 bucks back then. And nobody bought the course. So here I am trying to be a direct mail entrepreneur, getting really excited, place my ad, which is a big deal for a kid who doesn't have much money. And it was 
venturing out to watch it bomb. And then I had to regroup and pivot, uh, which has been one of the things I've had to do throughout my life and another lesson in success and say, okay, what do I do with the five lessons? I took the five lessons, I put them together and I called it a book. And so instead of a correspondence course, now it's Zen in the Art of Writing, the book. And then, of course, I shopped that. Because it's before the internet, that was a very long process. You have to put your book in a manuscript, put stamps on it, send it out, and then wait until the second coming before your book comes back, usually with a rejection, and then you go through the process again. Well, somebody did publish it in 1984. And it was a moment of celebration and a moment of devastation. I celebrated because I'm finally published. The author is finally an author. He's published. And the devastation was realizing publishers don't know shit about marketing books. They're glorified printers. They don't know anything about marketing books. I sold more books on my own, word of mouth and door to door, so to speak, than the publisher ever did. And I got a letter from the publisher saying so. But the good thing there, Darren, is that that was a turning point as well because it taught me to learn about marketing, which sent me down a whole nother glorious path that I still use today. And um, <coughs> God, it's, it's so hard because you, 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 you're so good at this that I, I want to ask you five questions that, uh, after every answer. But I think the <laughs> next, the, to, to stay on that, I think maybe the, uh, the book writing process is Okay, because you've written so many books, is is there some? Um, I don't know, how how do you write them quickly? Is there a process there that helps? Like, yeah. do you have kind of? You know, I don't know. You can take it a lot of different ways. Where it, where is it? Inspiration that happens? Is it like like you said before, where you're writing some lessons and then you put it all together and make it into a book form? I don't know. Take it any way, which way you want. But I think oh. it's very interesting because I would love to uh, write a book or a few books, but I, I, I just haven't made that a priority yet, but uh, I'd, I'd love to hear some, um, your expertise on the, on the subject. I'm going to tell you the truth. Anybody who hangs around me for any length of time writes a book. They <laughs> write a book because first of all, I'll see the book in them. They won't even see it. I'll see the book in them and I'll point it out. Remember the Bruce Willis and the sixth sense and the kid says, I see dead people. I see authors. <laughs> well, funny enough is you wrote a book with uh, Daniel Barrett. And I was like, you know what? I could write a book. If, Dan if my buddy Dar Daniel can write a book, I could write a book. Yep. Like, well, why, why, why can't I? Uh, and, right? Well, that's true. And there's so many different ways to write a book. I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories. When my father was 90 years old, I turned him into an author. He had no desire to be an author. I only saw him read one book in the entire time that I knew him but he was the most fantastic storyteller. And so I had encouraged him at one point. I said, why don't you just start recording these stories about your life? And I bought him a cassette player. He didn't know anything about CDs. So I got him one of those old cassette players and, you know, we just push record on it and he can start talking. And my mother was dying at the time and he was taking care of her. And in the mornings he'd get up, he'd do his workout and then he'd sit at his desk and he would tell stories to the recorder. And then he'd go take care of my mother. And he did that for a while. And then one day he sent me a box and the box had the cassette player <laughs> in five cassettes, five 90 minute cassettes with a little note saying, I recorded the stories you wanted. And I thought, well, who plays cassettes now? But I went looking and I found somebody to transcribe those. Then I got an editor to put them into a format that I could read. Then I reread them. I moved them around a little bit. So there was a bit of a storyline and chronology. I wrote a forward to it. And then I, uh, I got a cover made for it using a photo I had taken of my father. And then I used Amazon's print on demand service that used to be called Create Space. Today, I think it's KDS direct or something like that. I uploaded all of it to the to Amazon and I ordered a copy of it. And then I flew to Ohio and on my father's 90th birthday, there's actually a YouTube video of this moment. I looked at my dad and I said, do you remember that box of cassettes you sent me? And he said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, dad, I turned it into your autobiography. And I said, here's your book. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever seen him speechless. And his face got red and his eyes got glassy. And he held his book and he went, oh, oh my God. 
and my family was around the table. and They couldn't believe it. They were all speechless. And for me as his son, I had never been able to give him any gifts. He grew up in the Great Depression. He rejected any gifts. He didn't want anything. He didn't need anything. And it always hurt me. But I gave him that gift. So how easy was it for him to be an author? He spoke it. We transcribed it. We formatted it. We uploaded it. Done. There's a book. One and of the books, I, one of my new books, I'm going to pull it out to show you, uh, The Art and Science of Getting Results is brand new. I didn't write a word of this. The, uh, the publisher sent a fellow to the recording studio in Austin. We went to Joel Block Studio, Block House in Austin. And he sat there and he interviewed me. He said, what are the nine, uh, what are the nine ways to get clear so you can get results? And we went through every one of those and all of the audios being recorded the whole time. So I'm just talking, just like I'm doing right here. And at the end of it, all that audio was transcribed. That transcription was formatted and became this book. So it can be as easy as anybody wants it to be. Right down to, you can hire somebody else to write the book. Or if, like me, I do enjoy writing, you just sit down and you start, and you start writing. There's all kind of tips, ways to make it easy, ways to make it fast. Uh, I even have a book. I don't have it here with me, but it's called Instant Manifestation. All it is is a collection of my blog posts. I picked a bunch of blog posts that were on the same topic, which was manifestation, law of attraction, the secret, and thought, well, these all fit. Wrote an intro to it, put them all together, uploaded them to Amazon, and somebody could go buy it there. So I've got lots of tips and advice when it comes to getting a book done because, yeah, I've done it. Well, and I think there's a lot of parallels to what you've said, uh, not just here, but in other areas of just general um, content creation strategies. I just had um, a Pablo uh, Gonzalez on the podcast who his content creation strategy is a little like, Let's get on a Zoom call. Let's chat like we're doing now. And then let's transcribe it, highlight what's good, and then push that out, right? And boom, all, all of a sudden now we have marketing materials, right? So it sounds like the same thing, same process could be one of the ways to publish a book. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of times, what I love about the podcast scenario is a lot of times we get, you know, a question comes up to where something very interesting pops in your head and a little magic happens, right? And I think the same thing could happen in uh, the process that turns out to be a book. I think a lot of people stop, though. They, they publish on social media, then don't go that extra next step of distributing it to a, a book format. And I think uh, they should for a lot of reasons, Darren. I've, I've said for years, in fact, way back in Houston, before the Internet came along and I was living in Houston, I was giving talks on the three reasons to write a book. And I said it was fame, fortune, and immortality. Three reasons to write a book, fame, fortune, and immortality. And one of the, the things that comes from a book is authority. You're now the expert on whatever that subject was. One of my very first books was called Hypnotic Writing. And I was establishing myself as a copywriter, and people were hiring me back then to write sales letters and websites and this, that, and the other. But there's lots of copywriters out there in the world, and some of them are phenomenal. Some of them are far, far, far better than me. But when people got down to making a decision, did they want a copywriter who had no proof of their credentials? Or did they want the inventor of hypnotic writing who has a manual called hypnotic writing? More often than not, they hired me. And they hired me because I'm an author. And I've seen that across the board. In fact, if you look at the word authority, the word author is right in there. I love that. And that's a great way to position yourself, especially when there's so much noise in this, this new digital world. Let's, let's go into a different direction of, you know, COVID, um, this quarantine situation, isolation. Uh, maybe let's start with isolation. I think isolation can be a gift, but also can be <laughs> terrible <laughs> too. Um, I don't know, like what's your, you know, I, I don't know, maybe we'll start there as a gift, a gift or curse here with, with being, I, I feel like we all have a lot more time, but yet not a, nothing <clears throat> too. It's, it's a weird deal with COVID. <clears throat> I wanted to hear your thoughts of like how you've been coping, how things have been going, what you've been seeing. I don't know, anywhere where you want to take it there. Well, it's dramatically affected me too. My 
my biggest source of income has been from speaking on stage around the world. Before this hit, I was just in Russia, I was in Iran, I was in the Ukraine, I was in Italy, and I was booked to be in all those places and more for this year. All of those are canceled. Everything's been canceled. Everything's been locked down. No money's been coming this way. It has been very difficult to, to live the lifestyle that I had for the last three decades up to this year. So there's massive changes for me as well. And I, I hear all of the negativity that people spout, especially if you spend any time on social media. And in my own meditation, I finally came up with my own angle and I started promoting it on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And I said, there's a divine conspiracy. There's a divine conspiracy. And what this whole thing is, is a great gift to all of us. The, the virus and the fact that we're being isolated is planet Earth sending us to our room. And in our room, we're being told by the authorities, stay inside or go inside and stay inside. Well, to me, that's a very metaphysical command. That means go inside you. So I've been taking the stance that this is a good thing. And while we're inside, it's our time to reflect, to meditate, to contemplate, to create. This is our time to reset ourselves. This is our time to find out what do we really want and what do we want to contribute to the world. This is also the most fantastic time for people to learn anything that they want or to open any business they want online. There was a massive virus, a deadly epidemic that killed hundreds of millions of people 100 years ago. And in 1917, 1918, we didn't have this. They could not communicate. Talk about isolation. They were dying in their homes, not knowing what was actually even going on. And there was the same lack of leadership, same miscommunication with the media and so forth. Same kind of things playing out, which also shows that we don't learn from history because we're not reading books. And what we have here today because of Facebook, the Internet, all the social media, Google, YouTube, everything else is the most miraculous chance to do all the things we ever said. The, for the person who said, I I've always wanted to learn how to say, uh, speak Spanish. Go to YouTube. There's lessons there. I mentioned I was now playing the saxophone. I actually recorded a, an album of my own saxophone music. I bought a saxophone. I thought, well, I don't even know how to put the reed on. I went to YouTube. How to put the reed on <laughs> is there. And then you take the opening lessons, you know, all there. If there's anything you've ever wanted to learn, Google it, for God's sake. There it is. If you ever had an idea for a product or service, here's your chance to turn it into a digital product, an audio, a video, a book, something, or create something we haven't even seen or thought of yet and distribute it online. And if you don't know how to do that, you YouTube search it or Google search it. How do I open my first business online? So for me, we can certainly look at this as, you know, the Charles Dickens thing. It was the worst of times. It was the best of times. I say life is an optical illusion. You got to get whatever it is that you believe is out there. I am choosing to believe this is a divine conspiracy. The universe itself wants us to go inside and reset. So that's what we're doing. You know, it's what I'm doing. And I've seen your social media lately really uptick, right? right. You, you've, you've taken and done much more videos and stuff that might have took you four or five years to do, 10 years even. And I think we have jumped ahead in 10 years in a lot of different ways. I'm a big e-commerce person, so there's a, there's a lot happening in that space. But what I do want to talk a little bit more about is the you know meditation and going inside yourself. I, you know, I think there's a lot that you were just talking about of how to actually motivate yourself to do the things that you've been wanting to do. What about any tips on how to either it doesn't even have to be meditation, but to calm the brain a little bit to to chill out because every time you go online, that's not escape anymore. That's like a terrible thing almost. Mm -hmm. You know, any any advice for people that really are having a tough time being alone in a room, right? Yeah, and it makes total sense. So I understand that. I was on a show the other day and the fellow was saying every time he went on social media, he got upset. He felt himself get upset. He was being triggered by random people, many of which aren't his friends at all, but saying things that upset him. And then he realized that, oh, he really likes um, guitar harp music. 
So he had done a search for guitar harp music, and he started listening to that. And he listened to it for, I don't know if it was 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and he felt his whole body just kind of soothe. Everything just kind of relaxed, and he moved into that space of closer to bliss. And I think that's really the advice. We want to find out what actually works for each of us. I have a pool here, and thank goodness I have a pool here because I'd probably go berserk just being in the house itself. As much as I like books, at some point I need the sun on me. <laughs> and so that has become one way for me to relax. As I go in the pool, and as I think you know, I smoke cigars, so I'll, I'll blow uh, rings of smoke to the gods as I'm in the pool, relaxing. So it's one of the ways that I will do it, as well as with music. I saw a movie the other day, and the movie was forgettable, but there was a technique in it that the woman said she learned from a Navy SEAL. And it was a, the idea of breathing in slowly to the count of four and then breathing out slowly to the count of four. And there were a couple of times where I thought, well, let me just try that. And I was just going one, two, three, four. And then I went one, two, three, four, just slowly did it in and out. And I swear to God, it just totally chilled. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're focusing on your breath, so I do I do that the four, I do the eight eight in and eight out actually, and what that does is you're focusing on the eight in and eight, eight out right eight seconds in eight seconds out, and then you just forgot about everything else you were thinking about right, right. because our brains just keep going and keep going right. Um, well, it's giving I, I, the the brain something to focus on. You know, when I was learning songwriting and everything you know this because you made the video, they got 1 million hits. I studied with Melissa Etheridge, who is in that video that's on YouTube. And I still remember when she gave me a tour of her studio, she gave me a tour of her kitchen, her guitar collection. But there in the middle of everything was a giant jigsaw puzzle. And it was one of the things she and her wife would play with is that they'd go and focus on something else. And for them, it was a jigsaw puzzle. So I think there's something like that for each person. It's not a jigsaw puzzle for me. It might be a cigar in the pool and occasionally breathing. But there's something that each of us can tune into to relax. I love it. And then um, I, and I feel like I, I, my apologies if I'm jumping around a lot, but I, I have so many notes and so many different places I want to go to. I don't, you know, and, and very little time. So Talk to me, and I th I'm going to use the word Hawaiian healing because I don't mm. want to ruin the word. <laughs> talk, <laughs> talk to me about this kind of th this Hawaiian healing. Let me just do that and let you go into that, right? Because I, I've seen some of the videos and, it, and it, it sounds so fantastic, but I don't know that much about it, right? It is so huge, Darren. I don't even know where to begin. Wow. You know, at this point, I guess it was 15 years ago, I heard a story that I just thought was preposterous. It was unbelievable. I, I couldn't buy into it. And I'm a fairly open-minded guy. But I had heard the story of a therapist who helped heal an entire ward of mentally ill criminals in Hawaii. And he did it without working with any of them. And I thought, don't just, just, this sounds like an urban legend. Mentally ill criminals? Mentally ill criminals? And he doesn't work with any of them directly? What, what the hell is this? And But it gnawed at me. A seed was planted, and I dug the research, and, and I did the research, and I found the therapist. His name is Dr. Hulen. I did find out the story was true. I did find out that what he was doing was a Hawaiian technique called Ho'oponopono. And I was so fascinated, and I said, somebody has to bring this to the world. And I was fortunate enough to co-author the first book with Dr. Hulen. It's called Zero Limits. And Zero Limits is created a movement. My God, there are so many people around the planet that are now doing Ho'oponopono, which is wonderful and simple. The basic technique is to realize everything you see in your life is from your own perceptions. And your perceptions can be changed by working on the inside of you. And the Hawaiian method is very simply four phrases that you say inside yourself as a kind of prayer to your idea of God, the universe, the divine, what I call the great something, what Joseph Campbell called the great mystery. And you're saying, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Over and over and over again inside yourself as if you're talking to the universe and you're asking the universe to repair what you're seeing. 
but it's not going to repair what you're actually seeing. It's repairing the perception in you that is causing you to see it. And this is where it gets, you know, a little complicated because on one aspect in Ho'oponopono, there isn't anybody on the outside. All of it is a mirage. All of it is an illusion. All of it is a projection. And who's the projectionist? You. And so if you're trying to change anybody, whether it's mentally ill criminals or your mother-in-law, you're not doing it by addressing them because the problem isn't them. The problem is your perception of them. And that's huge. One of the biggest things that people grapple with this, and I did too when I first heard it, is the idea that we've heard the phrase, we create our own reality. I mean, that's big in the New Age movement and the law of attraction followers and the secret, you create your own reality. And most people would agree that they're responsible for what they say and do. But in Ho'oponopono, you're responsible for everything and everybody because it's all being perceived inside you. I did three seminars with Dr. Hulen, and he would get up at every one of those seminars and ask the question, have you ever noticed that when you have a problem, you are there? And he meant you're the common denominator. You're the reason that you're seeing the problem. It's not the problem, it's your view of the problem. And all of the inside work is truly done internally. And so I wrote a follow-up book 10 years later called At Zero to tell more stories, to explain this even more, and to, to really help people understand the depth of this. On the surface, I, I can't even imagine what people were thinking if they've heard this for the first time. You say, what? I love you. I'm sorry. Please hear me. Thank you. And somehow the world changes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and, and and let me go super deep with it because I, I do I, I love that thought of you know it's the perception of others the other person yes but I think a lot of people could say well what if I rely on that person what if that's my wife or soon to be ex wife or whatever and I know you're going through a dark time so maybe this would be a good t time to kind of talk about that as much as you want um, what about then when it's like somebody that you've relied on or have mirrored for a long time. It, does that actually still work for you, right? Uh, um, I, I you know. love that question. There's no ex get out of jail card here. You're responsible for all of that, all of it. And what I'm pointing to is that person, your view of that person is inside you. Your sense of whether that person is a problem or not a problem is inside you. All of the judgment, all of that perception is inside you. It's not in the other person. Somebody else could probably look at the other person and be in love and go, what are you leaving that person for? That's, that's a fantastic person. That's their perception. you got a different perception. And really in Ho'oponopono, what we're trying to do is get to a place of serenity. We want to get to a place within ourselves can we can, so we can look out into the world and see the miracle that is truly there, see it with a sense of neutrality, and choose where we want to go or not go. We may not want to be with that person simply because there's, there's not a match there, but there's not the heavy judgment that is still there. So this is, this is fairly intense, and yet it's totally empowering because if you realize all of the changes inside of you, that really means you only have to change one person. You don't have to change the rest of the world. You don't have to change the spouse or the ex-employee or the employer or whatever it happens to be. All the work, all of it is just reduced to one person. And and I want to go one step deeper, kind of an a, a external example. So I have a family member that's going through a divorce and that's a tough time and a lot of anxiety through that process. And, you know, you can't, you know, I, I, I get that, like, you know, I, I don't know, like what any, any help and whether this is in the, the, this area or something else, what advice would you give somebody that's having these situations, maybe a little feeling of helplessness because, you know, it feels so big and grand and tough. Any advice to somebody going through something like that? 
Daniel often jokingly calls me the answer man. So when you say, do I have any advice? Well, yeah, I got advice. I don't know if it's any good or not, but I've got an answer. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I don't want to dismiss. Who is this that's going through a divorce? So uh, A brother of mine. Yeah. A brother of yours. I'm going through a divorce. Uh, mine has been going on for 18 months. It has been pure agony. It Same has been there. hell. And, and it should and tough, not have tough. been this way. There and are no it's tough kids. Of, there's tough deal because the courts are, you know, yes. it, it's a whole, it's all backed up too. So it's yes. really difficult, right? Yeah. I, I'm going through all of that. And uh, in my particular case, none of it should be happening, at least in my opinion. No kids. Uh, I offered her virtually everything uh, just so I can walk uh, at the beginning. But because of her distrust and everything, she got attorneys. The attorneys lied, planted seeds, accused me of all kinds of things, turned into a persecution of my life and business. I have gone through grief, regret, remorse, mental anguish, mental torture. Um, and then I'm in a new relationship with somebody who developed Lyme disease. And my father died during this period. And when I went to his funeral, she ended up in the emergency room 2,000 miles away. And so there has just been, oh, intense, intense pressure coming. And then throughout all of this, a pandemic hits, you know, and it's like, well, Joe, if you didn't have fun with what you were already doing, we're going to add this and isolate you as well. So I mentioned the Stoics earlier, and the Stoics have really helped me through this. Marcus Aurelius, who's pretty much the poster boy for Stoicism, has a quote that says, if you could endure it, then endure it. Stop complaining. And there have been days when I would look and go, oh, man, I hate this. I don't know that I could endure it. But if I look at it with stark, tough love eyes, can I endure it? Yeah. Do I want to? No. Can I? Yes. Then endure it. Keep going. The other thing is the, uh, the Stoics do a negative visualization, which sounds kind of weird to somebody who's been teaching positive visualization in the law of attraction movement. You know, you focus on what you want. You focus on everything being peachy. You focus on, you know, the night of the performance going great. You do the positive visualization. And there's a lot of scientific proof for that to work. But the Stoics say, no, spend a little time imagining the worst. What's the worst that could happen? Because if you can imagine the worst, and should that happen, you won't be taken down by it. A part of you will go, oh, I was already prepared for that. And so part of me has had to role play that aspect of it. Certainly, I still want the divorce to end. I would start, like it to end benevolently, quickly, tonight, right now. Give me a phone call. Let's be done. Uh, but as I say this, we're scheduled to go to a trial, which seems surreal to me. A trial over what? Zoom, Order. yeah, Zoom trial. Yeah, yeah an it, actual. It, they're courtroom. happening. They're happening. Yeah. Yeah, they are it's, happening. It, it's trial. crazy. Um, but let I, me I say love, one more thing about yeah, this. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yeah, one more thing. Because Seneca went to trial, Socrates went to trial, and both of them were ordered to kill themselves. Both of them went home, and from all the records that we know, neutrally, if not happily, did it. Mm-hmm. I look at that and going, well, that's not going to happen to me. I mean, the judge isn't going to say, hey, Joe, go kill yourself when you go home. Um, He will make some sort of decision about property and division and everything. But whatever it is, I can endure it and I will go home and handle it. And then one more thing, and this is largely for your brother. Early on in this divorce, when it was all happening and was looking to be longer term and more expensive, more emotionally draining than anything I ever imagined. And I was at my wits end. It's like, how in the world did I get here. How did this happen? I asked one of the attorneys, I said, you've done a lot of divorces. This is, this is new to me. I don't know this world. And I said, what's the best advice you ever heard for somebody going through a divorce? And he paused and he thought, and he finally said, focus on the future. Focus on the future. And that has kept me going. I have actually a sheet of paper over there and it says the day after the divorce. These are all the things I'm doing, (laughs) some of which I will be allowed to do because you're not allowed to spend money or sell things and stuff like that during a divorce. So all of this is in the realm of trying to help your brother and saying, look, we can survive virtually everything one day at a time. And always this too will pass. I love it. Let's talk about something fun. Favorite car. 
What's your favorite car? <laughs> uh, to thank you. I mean, you just got my head to spin there. Favorite car. Wow. Yeah. The I whole, would say whole my spin. Spiker is my favorite car, rarest car, most unusual car, handmade car over in Holland. Uh, there's only 300, I think, ever made, maybe two in the state of Texas. I have a pristine aluminum-based 2,000-pound, 2008 um, Spiker C8 La Violette. Very rare. It, it's more of a James Bond car than any of the James Bond cars that have been in any of the movies. It's got those scissor doors that go up, and it's got that control in the, the manual shift where you have to push the button in the middle, and it's all heavy aluminum. And the aluminum on the, on the dash, it's all been hammered by a guy using a hammer. I mean, these are handmade works of art, and it's very light. It's very low to the ground, wide back, and the engine is in the back. So when you go down the road, you are a low-flying jet. And get out of my way because, you know, why stop? And and that's one thing with COVID, you know, it's been great. So I have that 69 Camaro that you've yeah. seen convertible, and it's running so much better now that days, too. I'm, I'm really happy with it. I got a buddy that comes over not now but before covid would just come over and work on the car and uh you know that's something my wife and i have done is just go drive like drive around you know um so i wanted to do that because i want to i want to <clears throat> move to a couple fun things first i want to talk about is money i think a lot of people have a native connotation with money with wealth with what that means and i know you you've talked about this a lot but i'd still would love that you're your kind of uh, perception or thoughts or any advice with money uh, in, you know, and in, in however you want to take it, right? Yeah. Well, I love talking about money, especially because, you know, I was broke, I was homeless, I was in poverty, and I know what it's like to be without it. Uh, I also know what it's like to have it, and um, I prefer that. So what I have found is, and, and this is huge, so I want to make sure that I'm of help to the people that are listening and watching this. So I want to make sure I get this point across. I have been in countries all over the world. I have been in cultures vastly different from Iran to Russia to Poland to all points in between. And every single culture, every single country seems to have this same limiting belief. Once you get rid of this one limiting belief, you start to allow money to come into your life. Because the truth of the money, the, the matter is, is money's all over the place. There's trillions of dollars circulating right now circulating, not just stashed in mattresses and banks someplace. This is actually circulating. It's in the air. And you can take your bucket and go get as much as you want once you remove the internal limitations. And that's the only thing blocking us. I had this as well. We have it in our unconscious mind. So what is this thought? All I have to do is begin it and everybody will finish it. Money is the root of all they Most all, people say evil, they, right? Everybody but, just said evil. So yeah, let's stop but, and look at this. Money is the root of all evil. Do you want anything evil in your life? Hell no. Consciously or unconsciously, if you thought money's bad or evil or tainted or will corrupt you in some way, you are not going to want it. Money ends up being a necessary evil. Money ends up being something that very often I will ask people, do you uh, get money in the nick of time to pay your bills? Yeah, usually you do. Why? Because you didn't want it in your life. You waited to the last possible window of opportunity. You let it come in and then psh, you got rid of it. You went and paid your bill. Then you broke again. Why? You didn't want the money in your life. So let's clear this up. First of all, money is the root of all evil is a fracture of a statement from biblical literature. The longer line, which may or may not even be accurate, we don't know, it was thousands of years ago and translated, paraphrased, retranslated, and ends up in our hands. And we don't really know where it came from. <clears throat> the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Well, that's a little better. Until you start looking at some of the, the wealthiest happiest, healthiest people. They don't love money. They appreciate money. They leverage money. They use money, but they don't love money. That is the big difference. If we move or when we move into that space of realizing money is a tool, 
I, I've made a couple of videos where I held a pen, this very pen, and I would say, is this pen good or bad? Because with this pen, I can probably stab you. But is it the pen or is it me? People make choices about their tools. Money's not making any decisions. You're making decisions about money. Money has no beliefs about you. You have beliefs about money. I have a new book. It's called, you shouldn't be surprised. I have new books all the time. <laughs> money loves speed. And I dedicated this to Dan Kennedy. And the quote I put in the front is from Arnold Patton. And this, this transforms everything for people. The sole purpose of money. The sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. Darren, you take that in and really integrate that, and you can allow money. The sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. So what does that mean? When I first heard it from Arnold Patton, I thought, well, there's bound to be some exceptions. And then I went to write the phone bill, and I went, well, I'm, I guess I'm grateful to have a phone. Then I'm writing the mortgage. Oh, I'm grateful to have a house writing the internet bill. I'm grateful to have the internet writing a car payment. I'm grateful to have the car. And I, I realized I'm just saying thank you with money. The sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. There's so much to say about money. Uh, I actually have a book, Attract Money Now, that's free. People can go to attractmoneynow.com and just download it. Uh, that could help. Money loves speed. I've got a the audio version of this and the ebook is available at moneylovespeedbook.com in case somebody's interested. But I just want them to realize money's neutral. It's not evil. It's not bad. It doesn't corrupt. And you can use money to fulfill your dreams. Those things that you want to make a difference, those people you want to help, those causes you believe in. When you allow money to come into you, you're a steward and you can send it in different directions. I've done this a lot with different people who had Kickstarter programs or ideas or inventions or musicians who were struggling. And I really believed in them because I can allow money to come in. I can also go, hey, let's send some over there. Let's send some over there. So making peace with money is huge. And something that the, from the first time we met, you said some stuff about money and, you know, it wasn't, you know, I think I internalized it some way. And then, you know, you watch a couple of YouTube videos. I'm a big fan. Every time at lunch, I try to learn something while I'm having lunch, which is just usually YouTube, podcast, whatever it might be. But something stuck with me, and, and this is something I say all the time, that money is fuel. And I and with and when that when that clicked in my head, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Without it, without a budget, I can't do anything that's that great. Even you were talking about video and stuff. If I have a budget, I can make a better video, right? I can I can do a lot more. I can reach more people. I can give back. I can, you know, I can do a lot more if I have fuel in the tank. And money is what what creates that. And ever <clears> since <throat> that clicked in my head, I'm like, how do I get more fuel so I can do more things? I can help more. I can do more. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. You have expect miracles right behind you, right? Right. So what's what what's that mean? Yeah, no, I'm wearing a T-shirt that says expect miracles. It's because it's, it's for the same reason that I say there's a divine conspiracy. I'm trying to give a different perspective to life. So many people say expect crap, expect shit, shit happens. You see the bumper stickers, you see this as an attitude, and they don't realize that they're falling into a negative bout that will attract more negativity. And I don't mean this in any metaphysical way. I mean this in very basic psychology. Whatever you're focused on mentally your mind has been alerted to look for more of it. This is why when you buy a new car, you know, I remember when I got a Volkswagen a long time ago, I don't know when that was, in the 70s or something, it seems like suddenly Volkswagens invaded the country only because my mind had become alert to Volkswagens. And so when people start thinking about, oh, shit happens or crap, hap crap happens, they look for it, create it, and broadcast it. And I'm like, come on, expect miracles. Let's shift this. So expect miracles. That's the new message. I love it. Um, what about your, if you could go back and tell your 16-year-old self anything, like any advice, what would you give yourself? Don't get in a ring with Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, 
And um, I, you know, I did see, and I don't know if you have any comments about this, but there is a new secret movie coming out. Yeah, like, Friday. That, like a, a like an actual movie, like a yeah. like they're doing like a, a Hollywood type movie. Um, it, any 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 thoughts or anything that you want to say about that? I just think that's kind of interesting and, and, and exciting. It's like a Katie Holmes and Josh Lucas in it, I think, and, and Jerry uh, O'Connell is in it. Yeah, and it's yeah, produced wow. by Rhonda Byrne. It it is a Hollywood movie. And I've been promoting it since I've known about it. They filmed it last year. They were going to release it in theaters somewhere uh, months ago anyway. But the pandemic hit and they just pulled it. And then for for good reasons, they decided they're going to release it on July 31st on um, View on Demand or whatever it's called, Pay on Demand, something like that. So Amazon will have it. Apple TV will have it. Wherever you can pay for a movie, you'll be able to see it there. And I believe it's called The Secret Dare to Dream. And what do I think? I'm excited for this. It's so amazing that the movie The Secret came out in 2006. And whether I was in it or not, I would still praise it. I would still tell people to watch it. It really turned the world on its head. And it brought a very simple concept to the masses. And it did it because it made it easy for people to absorb. All they had to do was sit in front of the TV, sit on the sofa, eat popcorn, and there it was. Talking heads, well done, are giving you a message. But what would be even better than that is a really good story with character, with conflict, with a resolution. And that's what they finally done with this movie that they're releasing. I've not seen the movie. I've only seen clips of it. But I'm going to be waiting for it on Friday, July 31st, just like anybody else. And if this airs afterwards, go looking for it on Amazon and Apple TV and go watch it. It'll just be a few days after. But um, what has this, you know, how did you get on The Secret, the movie? What, what's it done for you? Because that, that, that was so massive. I remember yeah. when that came, came out. It was so massive. It was everywhere, like <laughs> worldwide, like nuts. And it's still going around the world. I, I, I find it so unbelievable that a movie that came out in two, South 2006 is still being seen as fresh content in countries that are now asking me to go visit like Iran and so forth. These other places that I never thought I would go in my lifetime, but I've been there because of the movie, the secret I was invited to be in the movie because Rhonda had read one of my books. She read the attractor factor, which is about the law of attraction. And she called me up. And back then I was answering my phone myself and so I got her on the phone and we talked and she said she had an idea for a movie. She wanted me to be in it. Well, I, I hear from people all the time, most of which say they have an idea but never do anything. So I said, sure, if you get it together, you want me to be in your movie, call me back. Thinking, I'm never hearing from this woman again. But 30 days later, they called, said they were filming, they had a budget. They wanted to fly me to Chicago. And Darren, I almost didn't go because I was really busy and I thought, how am I going to go to Chicago? I got to do this. I got these appointments. I got this book coming out, blah, blah, blah. And they, they were very convincing. They said, we'll fly you first class, get to the airport. We'll fly you. We'll pick you up in Chicago. We'll take you to a hotel, two hours in the hotel. We'll take you back to the airport. You know, you're going to do it all in a whirlwind of a day. And I said, all right, reluctantly went there. <laughs> and they filmed my part in a bedroom. You know, I, I didn't know if I was filming a porno movie or, or what I was doing here. <laughs> In a, in a bedroom with the engineers and Rhonda and a makeup person. And still, you don't know where any of this is going. At that point, it was my first movie, and so I'm flattered that somebody wants to put me in a movie. And it wasn't until I started to see the trailer for the movie that I realized if the movie is anywhere good as her teaser, is it, this is going to be phenomenal. And when the movie was finally released, I was the very first person to promote it because I had already written my promotional email six months earlier. I, I wrote it, and every day I just waited for Rhonda to give me the green light. When she said you could not promote it, I did. <laughs> and I haven't looked back. What did it do for me was your other question. I had already gained notoriety as a um, internet marketer and copywriter, but the movie threw me into the self-help world in a big way. I had self-help books, but they weren't you know, out there in a giant way. I wasn't known for it. Because of the movie The Secret, they probably know me on Mars and Pluto and other planets. And because of the movie The Secret, most people don't know about my internet marketing background or my publicity background or my copywriting background. They know me as the secret guy or most recently as the Ho'oponopono guy. 
But the secret just, uh, I will always be grateful. First, because the movie's fantastic. I was flattered to be in it. And it did elevate me, my name, my career, my brand in ways that are priceless. And and the law of attraction, right? Um, and I know you could talk about that forever. And I don't. I want to be cognizant of time because I have probably two more questions. But um, like, is, is that something that you used to be able to get on that movie or other areas? Like, I would love to have the kind of an instance where it actually has worked for you and then also then come, draw it back. Because I think a lot of people hear some of these things and see, I believe in it because I've seen it work for me. Like, you start ble- thinking about it, putting it out there, and then all of a sudden it, it falls out of your mouth and, and some conversation and whatever happens. This podcast is very much one of those things. I was at a New Year's Eve party and I've been wanting to do a podcast. And I said, I don't know, it just happened. And this guy's like, oh, I have one. Why don't you be on my show? And then he helped me start this one. So um, I don't know. I think, you know, uh, talk, to, talk to us more about the law of attraction. Well, I love the law of attraction, but I also know that it gets a lot of flack because of the word law. People wrestle with that. They'll say, it's not a law. There's no proof it's a law. It's not like the law of gravity. And then we get into a big argument about it. So I would change that to say it's a principle. And I would say it's it's more useful to look at it from the world of psychology than from the world of metaphysics. I'm very much a metaphysical guy. I am in the woo-woo. I do talk to angels. I do believe in the esoteric, invisible connections, all of that. But I, I want to talk in a way that reaches the biggest audience. And I'm really, I'm talking about how you direct your mind. Most of us are reactionary. We just respond to the things that happen to us in life without much idea about choice or setting intentions or where we want to go about any direction. And the law of attraction is really the law of intention. You're going to get, and you're going to go in the direction of whatever it is you verbalized. Most people verbalize what they don't want, and they end up saying, well, I I don't like being broke, and then they end up for the rest of their lives saying, I don't like being broke, not realizing they have to interrupt that and start to say, I choose to be financially wealthy, or I choose to be financially secure, something that's believable that moves them in the direction of where they want to go. It's believable, but it's a stretch, so they're moving that way. But that's not the only element that works with the law of intention or the law of attraction. You've got to apply emotion to it. Most people are focused on what they hate or what they fear. If you focus on what you hate or what you fear, you get more to hate and more to fear. You've trained your mind. You put your mind on alert to say, here's what I'm aware of and here's what I want to know more about. The other thing is we can focus on love. It doesn't have to be fear or hate. It could be love. So what I've been teaching, and and this is explained in the one book I just held up, Money, Love, Speed, is that you need to state your intention. What is it that you want to have, do, or be? From a pure psychological standpoint, you're going to start going in that direction because you've given your brain a target. The second thing you want to do is to think about it with emotion, the emotion of love. Think about the benefits of having, doing, or being whatever it is that you would like to have. You and I are car guys, so it's really easy to go, well, I really like to have this car and visualize the car, and then to go to the next step and imagine driving it and how thrilling it would be. We wouldn't be sitting behind a wheel going hate or fear. We'd be feeling some sense of love. And then the third thing is repeating this. We want to repeat it, which is why it's so common in self-help literature for them to say, write down your goals, put them on a slip of paper, tape it to your bathroom mirror or to your refrigerator or to your dashboard. Why? Because you're telling your brain, here's your new target. Now, esoterically and metaphysically, I also think when you do all of that, you are sending an order to the esoteric Internet. And it is connected to all of us, and it can help send the signal from what you want to the person or people that can help bring it to you. And this is where people start getting moved around like chess pieces. Like, I don't know why I called that person, or I don't know why I went to that restaurant. And then you meet somebody who becomes instrumental to get what you want. The the esoteric internet kind of pulled those pieces together. 
And then let me say one more thing here that kind of answers the question, I think, of what you want to hear. When you were asking me how I got into the movie The Secret, I told you the the reality-based answer. And that is, Rhonda read my book, The Attractor Factor. She picked up the phone and called me. But let's go to the esoteric previous thing that I did. I was in a mastermind with a group of people. We would meet every Wednesday at a restaurant. I went in one day and I said, I have a new goal. And they said, what's that? I said, I want to be in a movie. I had never been in a movie, never talked about a movie, didn't know anybody in the movie. It just came out of nowhere, blue sky. I just walked in and said, I want to be in the movie. And I said, I don't want to be the guy in the back with sitting at a bar with his back to the camera and I have to explain to everybody, that's me, that's me. See my hair or lack of it? And uh, so I said, I want a prominent role in the movie and I want the movie to make a difference. And everybody just kind of nodded their head, all going, well, I don't know how this is going to happen. One month after that, I got the phone call. So I still believe to this day, it wasn't that the attractor factor was read by Rhonda Byrne. It was that Joe Vitale was in a mastermind and planted his request to the universe. I love it. What about the, the person who, you know, their parents or friends, which I think is very common, that kind of does the opposite of this, right? Oh, you're no good, or like, oh, you can't trade stocks, you have no money, or whatever it would be, you know, these this negative uh talk. Like how <clears throat> and I think you everything you said would work for some of those people already. But you know, what advice would you give those people? Like, you know, how to how to start turning this boulder in a different direction, right? Yeah, and that that's a great question. I'm glad you're asking it for the people that are wondering it. I am a great believer that you need to surround yourself with light. And what I mean by that is you need to surround yourself with the belief, with the people who will believe you and support you. Napoleon Hill has a great quote out there that says, the number one reason people fail is because of family and friends. He said that was the number one reason. And so what I learned is that even today with me, 67 years old and with a pretty good track record of success, if I have a new thing that I want to do, I don't tell other people except the most select of the select few that can support me in achieving it. And why? I don't want anybody raining on my parade. I don't want anybody telling me it won't work or it can't work. I don't want to hear criticism or negativity. All of that is easy. That is easy. It's the easiest thing in the world to tell somebody something won't work. But in the reality is you don't know if it's going to work. Nobody knows if it's going to work. You're acting from faith. You're acting from a belief in yourself and the possibility of a dream coming true. And to me, that's worth it because I don't want to be on my deathbed going, well, I wonder what it would have been like to sing at the Townsend that night. You know, I want to go and do it and find out about it. So I tell people, surround yourself with the people who believe in you. And at first, you may feel like you don't have it. But this is why there's books all around me. These are the people who believe in me. And then by extension, you mentioned Daniel Barrett, who's a dear friend. We co-authored The Remembering Process. I talked to him today. We did a FaceTime today just to be in contact because he believes in me and I believe in him. So that's what we need to do. Protect your dreams. Surround yourself with the people who believe in you. And at first, it might just be people in books. But you've got to make sure you keep the light going. Keep the light on until you can put together a mastermind and possibly meet in person. And my last question is how I always end the podcast is, how would you like to be remembered? (laughs) You know, when I was talking to Daniel earlier today, he said he was going to be going to New York and he knew the risk he was taking and this, that, and the other. And he says, well, if anything happens to me, just tell him to put on my tombstone. He was happy. And I thought, boy, that's that's really good. He was happy. <laughs> Whoever puts that on a tombstone, he was happy. And I thought I would really like it to say he inspired people. He inspired people or he inspired me. Well, Dr. Joe, it's a big pleasure to have you on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. I really appreciate your time. Um, it, was, it was a great conversation. Well overdue. Let's do this more often. Right. Um, I get all excited after I talk to you. I, I want to do a million things. So, Including writing uh, a book or two. Uh, that's probably going to be coming up soon. So, <laughs> I loved it. Thank you for the honor of being here. Godspeed to everybody and good luck to you with what you're doing. 
All right, man. Cheers.